This is Covering the Spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Saunas and Dr. Ed Feng. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. As we're taking a look ahead at week seven of the NFL with Gil Alexander of VEASAN breaking down his favorite bets on the board for week seven and a little bit of World Series talk in there as well. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here as always by Ed Fang. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com and find him on Twitter at ThePowerRankEd. Uh, for the people watching on the YouTube version of the show, you, they can see you're wearing a Michigan Wolverines pretty snazzy little shirt here, and uh, I kind of yeah. want one. Uh, I like it. It looks this sly. Was, yeah, this was the Harbaugh shirt a couple years ago. I don't. He's not still wearing it, but like, are you wearing khakis too? I'm not wearing khakis because that um, would be a little. I bit feel too like much. you got to amend that if you're gonna go with the Harbaugh look. You got to go full Harbaugh. Well. It's not exactly uh, fashionable to go around with the Harbaugh look in Ann Arbor uh, this couple of weeks, um, but but uh, yeah, one of the, the obvious one reason I wore this was because uh, Michigan has a pretty big game, um, and but the other reason I wore this is because it's black, and I'm a little sad, Jim. Oh no, I'm sad for the benching of your boy Marcus Mariota, my son, my darling son. boy. <laughs> he's not even gonna get. He's not even gonna trot out there at the beginning against the Chargers this week. Yeah. I feel like he may get into the game. I would not be surprised. I feel like he may get into the game. So, uh, but my covering the future was almost Chargers plus two. Uh, I decided against it because I like my other one more, just because it's more of a fun game to talk about. Uh, but sure. my boy, my darling boy Marcus, uh, people have been harsh to my son on Twitter. Well, uh, he's, he has struggled. Let's just he be, has struggled. Let's be clear. The man has struggled. So, what has Mario to struggle with. He's taken a lot of sacks. What right. does Ryan Tannehill struggle with? He takes a lot of sacks. And <laughs> for some reason, the Chargers, who are getting healthier, potentially getting their left tackle back this week, are two point favor or two point dogs. Right. I find that very confusing personally because I think that Mar- that Ryan Tannehill <clears throat> is at best parallel to Marcus Mariota and right. more likely a slight downgrade. Uh, yeah. So no. I find it very interesting. I agree with that. I thought about talking about talking about Chargers plus two for covering the future as well. Uh, okay. I decided against it because there's another game I like better. Okay, but, so <laughs> we're um, on the same wavelength here. But I, I did talk about it on on Gill's podcast earlier today, and one thing I found interesting: I've been getting into the pro football focus grades, and you know Tannehill graded out really well for a number of years in his career in Miami, which is a little bit surprising to me because uh, yeah. you never really saw the results there. And then just fell off a cliff last year. So it was a, you know, he was in the 70, at least the 70. Average is probably in the 60s. And then was a 45 last year. Yeah. So it doesn't give you much confidence in, in what he might do on the field on Sunday. From an advanced numbers perspective, I'm trying to pull this up right now because I actually had this up because I was comparing the two guys because I wanted to justify my hatred of Ryan Tannehill. Um, <laughs> you got to do it. There was a season in which Tannehill actually had uh, 51.76 passing net expected points. And that would have been back in 2014, I believe, which means that when you adjust for error, that's not a bad number. So I guess I'm not as surprised uh, that that he had good years. Um, But he's also 31, I believe. Uh, He is not too old in today's NFL. Right, and I think that my assumption would be that he'd be a slight downgrade. Again, I'm a hopeless Mario to truther to my detriment. Um, it's not gone well this year, we'll put it that way, but I think the Chargers plus two is probably the way I would go in that one. For sure. But I think that the morning black is very appropriate. So thank you, Ed, uh, for your support <laughs> in this time of need that I have. We're <laughs> going to bring on Gil Alexander. You can find him on Twitter at Beating the Book. We're going to talk about week eight of the NFL, get a little bit of World Series talk in there, talk about his thoughts on the Washington Nationals. Gil is a host of A Numbers Game on VEASAN, and he also has a Beating the Book podcast. And Ed, he, has a, he had a, an interesting guest on that podcast this week. Yeah, that would be me. <laughs> What'd yeah, you talk we, about? Had, we actually had a fun time. We uh, they they were they were uh, they were talking about my academic credentials and the and Stanford PhD, and I was like, you know, Stanford B's PhD is kind of like organic food. You know, it's really nice to have the label, but it doesn't guarantee the quality inside. What? <laughs> 
well, I will not stand for the slander of yourself on our podcast. Aaron. I'm not I will not for stand myself. for myself. I think I'm just fine. Right. Some of the other San <laughs> out there. You're talking that. more broadly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I will let it fly then. I know nothing of this, uh, but you know better than I do, so I'll let it fly. We also had Edward Egros, speaking of smart guys, we had Edward Egros on the show yesterday to preview week eight of college football. We talked Penn State, Michigan, speaking of that shirt again, Utah against Arizona State, Baylor against Oklahoma State, and more there. If you want to find Edward's thoughts on week eight, check out Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts, you can find it. And while you're there, please subscribe, rate, and review the podcast. That helps us out a ton. So thank you to those of you who have done so already. Now, before I bring in Gil to break down week seven of the NFL, we got to go back to last week. We talked to Rob Pozzola about the NFL and go back through what we discussed on that podcast. Covering the past. Last week on Covering the Spread, we had Rob Pozzola, as mentioned. You can find Rob on Twitter, at Rob Pozzola. And he mentioned Kansas City minus four against the Texans. And the Texans won that game out, right? There were some questionable officiating in that game, which annoyed me as a DFS player. But uh, the Texans did win that game. Rob and I both had the Rams minus three and a half against the 49ers. And as you are probably aware... Didn't go so hot there. I also had the under on that game, and that under did hit. But, whew, Rams minus three and a half went up in flames. So my bad there. Uh, Rob mentioned that he wanted the Jaguars minus one against the Saints. Saints won that one outright. Teddy, two gloves. Getting the job done, I guess. Most of that Saints defense, though. Uh, I mentioned the Eagles plus three. The Vikings won that game. I think the Vikings Actually, Rob wanted to stay away from that game. No, you had that. Uh, I had the Eagles. that game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rob, Rob uh, was smart and stayed away from that game. I think uh, the Vikings might just be like a stay away from me. The entire they, year. they might be with just what we've seen out of them. It, it's such a hard team to figure out. Uh, the defense might be respectable. Kirk yeah. Cousins, I really don't know. Um, the underlying metrics suggested it was a much closer game than the final score indicated. Yeah. Um, but still a loss. And... Like it's it's usually the Titans, the team that are the stay away from me from a betting perspective. It might be the Vikings. Like it's a good team that can have really bad games. I think that's like that's what the Titans were like last year and the year before that. I think that's the Vikings this year. I'm really hesitant to uh, <laughs> take a look at them. Uh, the Jets, I had them plus seven and a half against the Cowboys. Uh, Sam Darnold lit it up, mono free, tossing balls across the yard. Uh, a really Kind of a tough week across the board. Uh, underdogs cleaned up here, but I think that it was just a it was a, it was a rough week across the board. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, my numbers like a, a game uh, the the Monday night game, mm-hmm. Green Bay. I think minus three and a half. Not not something that made sense to me at home. And then right, uh, a lot of things happened in that game. It was a very interesting game to discuss because a right. lot of the narrative was that Green Bay. Uh, you know, Detroit got screwed, and they certainly did with some of the roughing calls. But the yardage, the yardage totals were way in in Green Bay's favor. Uh, had a couple of really costly turnovers uh, in that game, and then still could have covered if if Williams just goes into end zone for a touchdown. Obviously, right. made the smart play not to. Right. Uh, but well, and it was it was not just the the you know people focus on the penalties, penalties like you said, but they also had a drop touchdown by Aaron Jones. They had a drop touchdown by Jimmy Graham. Yep. They had a Drop ball near the end zone by Darius Shepard that was picked off, and he would not have been playing had Geronimo Allison and Marquez Valdez Scantling not gotten hurt. Basically, right. it was Aaron Rodgers throwing to undrafted dudes and still getting a win. Like, if you don't have the injuries to Allison and MVS in that game, it's probably not a two point game, and that Jamal Williams kneel down probably doesn't matter. So, right. I think that your numbers liking them minus three and a half made sense. Um, yeah, I think it made sense as well. Uh, really interested in Jimmy Graham. I mean, he does not look like a football player out there to me anymore. It's- so I thought that last year and I <clears throat> benefited from it, you know, thinking that he was washed. And then I watched week one this year and he looked really spry. And I was like, oh, man, I've made some mistakes because I was not in on Jimmy Graham for this year. And he looked kind of good. But he's looked terrible ever since then. Yeah. Um, yeah. Robert, it's, it's tough to see because, I mean, he was right. so dynamic earlier in his career. And right. It's just I not he, the same anymore. Did he tear both his patellar tendons uh, when he was with Seattle or was it just one? I can't remember. I, he, can't remember. I think it was just one. Um, but that's such a tough injury to come back from. I think we're seeing the effects of that the past couple of years. But Green Bay, they're a pretty good team. Um, I want to see them 
at full health. So I think it'd be very interesting, yeah. but they've been fine even without that. So credit to them uh, because that's that's crazy tough to do. We're going to bring in Gil in just one second. But first, if you want to get in on the action, check out the FanDuel Sportsbook and place your first bet today. If you lose, FanDuel will give you a refund of up to $500 in site credit. Visit sportsbook.fanduel.com for more details. Terms and conditions apply. Must be 21 plus and physically present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, or West Virginia, or soon Indiana. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Let's bring in Gil Alexander now. Find him on Twitter at Beating the Book. Again, you can find him on a numbers game on VEASAN and also on the Beating the Book podcast. Let's bring in Gil now to break down week seven of the NFL. Covering the present. Let's bring on Gil Alexander here to covering the spread. Gil, it's fun to have you back on here today. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Absolutely. It's a pleasure to have you here because not only can we talk football, which we will, but we also can talk a little baseball with you uh, because it's World Series time. We don't know who's going to be the AL representative yet, but the Nationals have already advanced to their first World Series and they're going to face either the Astros or the Yankees and the American League. It's either it's basically been the Astros and the Dodgers all year long. Obviously, no Dodgers, but the Yankees probably grading out a little better than the Nationals. So, what number would you need to get on this Nationals team in order to actually bet them, whether it be versus the Yankees or the Astros? Uh, well, I am set up with the Astros for for futures to win it all, plus three fifty, right after the Granky trade at the trade deadline. Wow. So for so nice. for me, it might not take as big a number as others. I will just hedge away, right, uh, and just set myself up. Uh, but I think that the true value here on the Nationals is right around. Uh, I, for me, it's about plus one forty ish, plus one fifty ish. I think if it's the Astros, it's a little higher uh, on the bang for your buck. Um, I had the Nationals to beat the Dodgers plus one ninety six in the uh, NLDS. I thought they're live. I think they're live in every series, Jim. To be quite honest with you, mm-hmm. as long as they have that pitching, uh, they have a puncher's chance. And um, they listen as long as they can get that starting pitching to do what it's supposed to do and minimize their bullpen. Yeah, they are in this. And I think the the sort of dirty little secret right now, people like to talk about the fact that the uh, the Cardinals were in a hitting drought. The Astros are in a bit of a hitting drought as we do this sort of three games in to right. the ALCS. Um, so that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. Obviously the Yankees weakness is the starting pitching, but I do think, uh, getting Tanaka with a rain out here and possibly, uh, you know, the best would be for another rain out, figuring out how to get him back for game seven. Right. Um, but I would, I would say to answer your question for me, it would be the nationals plus, you know, depending on who it is a little higher for the Astros, but right around plus plus one fifty in that pocket. It's kind of funny how hitting droughts tend to get extended when you face Max Scherzer and Steven Strasburg. And apparently Anibal Sanchez, too, uh, because apparently he is also in that same realm, which I shouldn't be that surprised about. He wasn't that bad this year, but like it still it still it still boggles my mind at times when he pitches as well as he has recently. Yeah, well, he's had a weird career, right? He was really good in Detroit for a period. Then he was really bad. Um, Well, he was good in Detroit, but unlucky. Because he, yeah. he like had these good peripheral stats, but his ERA would always be high because the Detroit defense was just trash and it, it ruined him. And I'm like, okay, this guy's got talent. And all of a sudden it flipped and it, it was very weird. Uh, but like the last two years, ever since like May of last year, <clears throat> he's been sneaky pretty good. Sneaky pretty good. And you know what? Him and uh, uh, Para have been like a real shot in the arm. It's not analytics based at all. Right. But Para coming over there has been a real, it's really seemed to have brought the team together. Uh, I think the you know an interesting question too, which for for betters has to be sort of assessed is is the ball different this postseason, yeah. right? Like is mm-hmm. is all of a sudden have the juice balls gone away? Uh, I spoke with Ben Lindbergh from the Ringer a little bit this morning. He was sort of working on a story trying to corroborate from a gambling standpoint. By the way, I might not, but maybe I sh- shouldn't be talking about this question. <laughs> uh, sorry, no, no, think about it. But I'm too far in already, guys. So I'm <laughs> But, uh, you know, he wanted to know from a gambling perspective if I had heard anything. Um, and the answer is no. I mean, I'd love to give him a sexy story, right? But I hadn't heard anything. But I do know some serious baseball bettors who are convinced that the ball is different. And, you know, maybe not a game like Game 4 tonight where the wind is supposed to blow out. But um, that's something to keep in mind for people who are assessing totals. I follow astrophysicists who are convinced of the same thing. So it's not just, you know, betters. It's astrophysicists. People who study drag <laughs> are convinced of the That's same right. thing that there. So I don't think it's that that far-fetched. 
yeah, yeah. Major League Baseball, of course, denying any knowledge yeah. of any of this. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, Gil, let's get on to the NFL. We had a couple teams that we thought were going to be pretty good, good early this preseason, uh, but they've kind of hit a rough patch. We're talking about the Chiefs and the Rams. Uh, what are you thinking about these two teams uh, going forward? Um, you know, the Rams, I think, have the Rams have issues short term and long term. Short term, somebody's got to figure out that offensive line. Um, long term, I have said this for a while now, and it made sort of people's heads explode when I said it on uh, on a numbers game on Vison. I always thought Jared Goff should should be the first experiment of a guy who should play on a rookie contract. And then they should try to recycle the quarterback. Like Sean McVay is that good as a quarterback whisperer. And I don't think Jared Goff is that super talented that they should try that because you can only win a Super Bowl with a Hall of Fame quarterback or a quarterback on a rookie deal who's overperforming and then spend your your resources, allocate your resources elsewhere, a la Russell Wilson. Uh, they didn't decide to do that, obviously. They're paying Jared Goff right. $134 million, $110 million guaranteed. Uh, and... Um, I just think they have salary cap problems moving forward. They have so much money tied up to him into Todd Gurley, who was on load management for sure. Uh, and uh, now with Jalen Ramsey. So I don't know about the Rams, the chiefs, you know, look, that defense is worse than it was last year. That defense is a sieve right now. I think the offense will score points left and right. Like they always do. I think they'll get it together. I think they're a playoff team for sure. Right. Um, but they do need to fix that defense because they are not a Super Bowl contender. Uh, the way that defense is playing right now. And the good thing with the Chiefs is they should get their, the left side of their offensive line is out right now, but they'll be back not too far down the road. So yeah. fixable things for them. With the Rams, like they just lost their left guard to a torn ACL. He wasn't good, uh, but they traded for Austin Corbett from the Browns, and then they've got issues at right guard too. So because you are generally pessimistic about the Rams, are you inclined to continue to fade them as we get deeper into the season? Yeah, I mean, it'll all depend, obviously, per game, what the line is. But I had the Niners before the season to win the NFC West. I'm feeling very good about myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, plus 395. Uh, and I'll tell you, that performance against the Rams last week was pretty spectacular. Mm -hmm. That defense flies around the field. I had an in-game on the, on the Niners at minus 6.5. They were only up 13. I could have been backdoored the whole way through. And the Rams just could not do anything. Couldn't do anything about it. They got stoned time and time again. Um, the only thing, obviously, that concerns me is Russell Wilson is capable of all kinds of magic. But, yeah, as far as the Rams are concerned, I like Sean McVay, but I'm not bullish about that team right now. And the weather only gets colder, and I will never forget Jared Goff's expression in that primetime game in Chicago last year when it was 32 degrees and he acted like it was 30 below. And I never <laughs> forgot that. I'm like, that's a little – can this guy play in inclement weather? He's a California kid. Uh, stuff like that matters to me late in, late in the season. So, yeah, just generally speaking, I am not bullish on the Rams. All right, let's dive into a couple of games here for week number seven here with Gil. Starting off with the a big NFC North battle between the Vikings and the Lions. Vikings a one-point favorite. The total here is at 46 points. And these are two of the teams, honestly, Gil, that I'm having the hardest time figuring out, especially the Vikings. Uh, I have no read on them at all. So which version of the Vikings do you expect we'll see going forward, or is it just a week-by-week -week thing with them? I think the better version of the Vikings. Like, I think that offense is really good. I think they have parts on defense. But I'm a Redskins fan, as Ed will tell you. Not a Redskins fan, but I was, I was born and raised a Redskins guy. So I am sort of innately drawn to watching all their games. So I've seen – more Kirk Cousins snaps in his career than maybe any human being alive. Uh, that's not a Redskin fan. And I kind of have that feeling of Kirk Cousins that I always have, which is can put up stats, but here you go, Minnesota Vikings, for your $84 million, you're going to get a lot of poor decision-making late in games, and I still worry about that with him. Um, I have them winning the division before the season started. I still think they're the best team in that division. You know, unless Aaron Rodgers does superhuman things like he did on Monday night. By the way, that was the thing that I think got lost in all that refereeing cluster yeah. uh, job on Monday night is that Aaron Rodgers made passes that defied human comprehension in that game. Um, yeah. But I like the Vikings long term. They do have a tendency to let you down. And then Detroit, who over there play against this weekend. God, I mean, they they had no business losing that game Monday. They squandered a game against Arizona earlier in the year. They end up 2-2-1 two, two and one, last place in their division. But this is one of these games. If you're going to take the next step, Detroit, you have to win this game. It's at home. You've got them. This is a game you have to win to take the next step. 
I would say the same thing for Minnesota. Minnesota, if you're the team that I believe you are, this is a game you must win. Um, it's not a game I will bet is basically mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say. Right. Uh, but I do, I do expect big things from the Vikings moving forward. Excellent. So we also have Ravens at uh, Seahawks. The Seahawks are a three and a half point favorite. Uh, the total is at 49. Uh, what is your take on this game? Uh, I think that total is a little low. You and I, Ed, talked about it a little bit on uh, the Megapod earlier today on the Beating the Book podcast. I think the total is a little low. Uh, it is a game that I wanted to wait for Seattle to come down to three. I believe it's three. Correct me if I'm wrong across the board now. Is that true? Three with extra uh... use. I am oh. looking right now. It is three and a half still at FanDuel Sportsbook. So Ooh. they're not budging. Well, I'll uh, to the number. It's but three it's three and a half plus 110. So yeah. there you go. I think you might be able to, not to not to say that people bet anywhere besides FanDuel, Jim. <laughs> but I think you might be able to find a three in, in some spots. Uh, and maybe even the FanDuel number comes to three, as you're saying. It's uh, plus 110 at three and a half. Um, I think the Ravens, though, can run through that Seattle defense. <laughs> and it is not, you know, I have to pick five games for Circle. All those of us who are in these contests have to pick five games. This was one I do a show at the beginning of the uh, week called Guessing Lines, which is a tribute to the old Stardust show. Uh, and I try to see what I would think the line would be, what it ends up being, and try to find value in that process. And I was surprised that, um, you know, this was as low as it was. But it's one of those that as the week has worn on, I'm like, yeah, I don't know how comfortable I feel about it. I think I like the over better than I do either side. Okay. Yeah. So later in the show, I'm going to talk about the under in this game. So pitch me oh. on the over. What pushes you toward? Is it just that I think that the defenses are bad. The so I think that that's bad. a good reason. Is How that the main that? reason for you? A deep dive analysis. Yeah. I believe the defenses are bad. Okay, yes. perfect. I, yeah. My numbers that's, think I mean, the same that's way. That's really what it comes down to. And I think Lamar Jackson, look, Seattle has trouble with the run. Lamar Jackson, I mean, last week what he set the record, first guy, 150 yards rushing and yeah. however many yards passing it was. Uh, forgive me for not remembering. And I think Russell Wilson is just capable of, of matriculating the ball down the field, up and down against the Ravens. So, yeah, over to me. And I think we were talking about it on the show this morning. I think that number goes up between now and game time. So okay. if you like the over, get it now. If you like the under, I'd, I'd wait. Perfect. Makes sense. I like it. All right, cool. Uh, let's move on here to the Eagles against the Cowboys. Uh, we got the Cowboys minus three here, and that one is stagnant there. The total has gone down in this game. It was 49 and a half. It's now 48 and a half. Interesting game here because the Cowboys have had some impactful injuries, but Tyron Smith and Lyle Collins returned to practice on Thursday. What's your level of concern around the Cowboys entering this game? Uh, pretty high. I mean, yeah. when I think if, if you know, look at that, we, we can, you know, I'm sure everybody knows. They've beaten the Dolphins, the Giants, and the Redskins. Mm-hmm. So there are your three wins. Um, they have a coach in Jason Garrett. Look, I think if you if you handicap one thing in the NFL, if you could only handicap by one characteristic, power ranking coaches might be a wonderful way to do it. And you have Doug Peterson, you have Jason Garrett, you know, Kellen Moore being his offensive coordinator. I have not been that impressed by Kellen Moore. Uh, and I think Doug Peterson, Doug Peterson, by the way, who sort of guaranteed victory already this week, said, we're, we're winning this football game. I guess that this line would be two and a half. It opened at three. I didn't really see any justification why the Cowboys should be full three-point favorites in this game. I think it's two and a half now, or it's creeping to two and a half. Um, so I don't obviously like the Eagles as much at that number, clearly not as much. The, the issue I have with the Eagles, and the Eagles I had before the season started is the team to make the Super Bowl. I am kind of tired of this thing with the Eagles where they're always banged up. Yeah. Like, at some point, we got to stop using that excuse with the team. Why are they never completely healthy? Um, so I like the Eagles. I like the Eagles more in a tease, quite frankly. Tease them through the three and the, the uh, seven. Make it eight and a half. Um, but if you can find a three out there, I might take a flyer on the Eagles. I'm, I just don't have any confidence in the uh, Dallas Cowboys right now, despite yeah. having their their linemen back the eagles are plus three but it's minus 130 so i'm guessing that that number you'd probably be staying away and looking elsewhere yeah I, i'll use the eagles probably in a tease i, I don't look it's the nfc east game um anything can happen the three is kind of a sort of default number that's used but these teams always whether it's the giants and the cowboys the eagles and the giants there's always these guys always seem to play in like a sunday night situation right um and uh, strange things happen. But given, you know, if you put, if you, if you made me pick, I'd take the Ingles, I'd take the points. 
Eagles in a tease is probably how I'll play this. Excellent. Gil, are there any other bets uh, for week seven that you are interested in? Yes, sir, there is. <laughs> was that for enthusiasm? Uh, <laughs> uh, San Francisco 49ers, man. San Francisco 49ers are now, to me, inexplicably, they've gone from a 10-point favorite to a 9.5-point favorite at the Washington Redskins. You will not get rich betting road favorites like that near double-digit favorites in the National Football League. Um, but I don't know how the Redskins score against this team. I think the Niners are really good. Uh, and I think games that they've barely won, who was that game against? Was it uh, Pittsburgh, where they were like minus three in turnovers? They still They're minus made... five, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, I think, they, I think they turned the ball over four times. Right, right, right. Yeah, they, they were actually minus three at the end because I think it was a garbage turnover. Okay, yeah. You might be right. But basically speaking, they were minus four. Um, I think that they go up and down the field against the Redskins. I'm not sure if it's Case Keenum now or Dwayne Haskins. Apparently Dwayne Haskins is taking some first-team reps. If it's Dwayne Haskins, this should be way over nine and a half. <laughs> um, I just don't think he – and, and look, I, I don't think there's any shame in it. He just doesn't appear to be ready, or at least that's the buzz right. to with. Um, but even if it's Case Keenum – the Redskins were two of 14 on third downs against the Dolphins. And while third down conversion rate <clears throat> is volatile, um, again, let me repeat, that was against the Dolphins. And I don't know that, the, again, I, I really feel strong about this Niners defense. Um, I would take the Niners. I would give the points. And the other one that I really like uh, is the Thursday night game. I like the Chiefs, minus three. And, um, you know, for, for much of the same reason why I liked him last week, I think it's a bit of an overreaction. It didn't work out well against the Texans when the Chiefs were giving four, but there was a, a real strange sort of uh, sequence at the end of the first half. But this is one of those games where you bet and you have to be prepared to lose. I'm taking the Chiefs minus three against Vic Fangio two weeks ago. I was saying this to Ed and, and the crew on the podcast this morning. Two weeks ago, one team was 4-0, and the other was 0-4. And if I had said to you, hey, two weeks from now, guys, when these two teams play on Thursday night, the Chiefs are only going to be three-point right. favorites. You would have immediately said, did Patrick Mahomes get hurt? <laughs> otherwise, you would never believe this line. So that's the other one I really like a lot. And Denver beat the Chargers on the road, which is not really a road game, and they beat the Titans at home. So right. what's the value in those two wins? Uh, not very impressive. Right. Not well, very they're impressive. better than two losses. That's true. <laughs> which they had been racking up before. That's Fine true. point, Ed. It's a fine point. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that is Gil Alexander. Find him on Twitter at Beating the Book. Gil, I know you have a busy schedule each day, so I want to thank you for swinging them by, spreading some knowledge for Week 7 of the NFL. I appreciate it. Good luck with that and your World Series and playoff bets, and hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Jim, Ed, thank you guys very much. I so appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Gil Alexander for swinging by and talking about week seven of the NFL. And Ed, we've actually talked about the 49ers a couple of times in this podcast. Yep. And you were an early buyer in them. And I agree. I think minus nine and a half against this Washington team is pretty attractive. They're, they seem really good. Yeah, it's an interesting game for me because my number is more like six or seven, okay. which I think is just kind of a reflection of uh, – you know, my model isn't catching up to San Francisco so early. And and probably our, our expectations are a little bit too high now. Sure. Just based on what, what they did to the Rams last week. Uh yeah, so that's a game where yeah, I mean I mean I'm it's a pass for me. But yeah, I, right. I definitely see the excitement. And I think that it also shows a value in your adjusted success rate model because that's the reason you were buying into the 49ers. Yep. And yep, in sure. the NFL, we have to we have to buy into small samples because the full season is not a large sample. And Absolutely. your numbers pegged them as being a good team after they had played just three games. So I think it, it kind of validates the value in looking at stuff like that. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate appreciate your mentioning that. And and like another team that was like pretty high up there early in the season as well was Tampa Bay. Yeah. But that was a team in which you looked at it and you're like, yeah, well, their defensive numbers look really good, but they're playing a bunch of first and second year guys in the secondary. Right. How much is that gonna how long is that gonna last? Right. And, and and we haven't seen that last. So uh, always, you know, the numbers are great. Still need to, to understand the, that it's small sample size, right. uh, even at this point in the season. And, and just be just be careful in our analysis. 
Right. They can lead you to the right, down the right path. You have to decide if that's a path you actually want to take. Yeah. In the case of the 49ers, it was a path you wanted to take, and yeah. that's worked out well so far. Ed that's, and I always uh, preach uh, searching. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Can I, I just wanted to bring up one thing because uh, Gil was talking about how Dwayne Haskins was taking first-team reps. Yeah. And one of the things that I was telling him about earlier when we recorded his podcast was what Dr. Eric Eager was telling us. Yeah. In that, you know, oh, when yeah, they yeah. Dwayne Haskins in college, they weren't particularly impressed. It was more because, uh, you Terry know, a McLaurin, lot of the he completed. Terrence were Campbell. Just, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're just like crossing routes and wheel routes and, and stuff that went a long way, which went a long way to the explosiveness of the Ohio State offense. But I don't think he graded out as – I think he said he didn't grade out as well in long NFL-type throws. Mm -hmm. And so so I think that's part of uh, – Gil, obviously, as a Redskins guy, was not so happy that I was telling him that. <laughs> And maybe he's not so happy that the Haskins might get some snaps this weekend. Yeah. Uh, but but something I wanted to bring up, because I thought that was um, what Eric Eager said was was fascinating. And I think short term, it's smart to be wary of Haskins because he had 15 games, at least 10 pass attempts in college. And that's unprecedented for a first round pick. And to have him start in year one. That's pretty scary. Like, Mitchell Trubisky was ragged on for his lack of experience coming out of college, and that's bore out. Um, he struggled right. early on and has struggled since, too. Uh, but Haskins <laughs> has a similar thing. He was right. better in college than Trubisky was, so I liked him more than I liked Trubisky coming right. out. But that's something to keep in mind, especially early well, on for Haskins, that he could have a slower transition. Well, absolutely. And Haskins isn't the athlete that, like, a Trubisky right. is no, or exactly. some of these There's other guys, too. Gap. So. He doesn't bring that to the table right. either. Right. And that's how Josh Allen's been able to mask some of his stuff is he's crazy athletic. Exactly. And he can scramble. Haskins yep. doesn't have that. And yep. I agree. That's uh, a good thing to point out as well. So I think it's going to be Case Keenum this week. It seems like that was because of a foot injury that, that Haskins was getting the reps. But once Haskins does get a second chance, I think it would make sense to be a little bit wary of betting on Washington. We were talking with Gil about trying to find good numbers elsewhere, and Ed and I always preach searching for the best value in betting on games. Well, look no further than the new odds comparison our engineers have cooked up over at numberfire.com. Oddsfire is a premier odds comparison experience across major bookmakers in the regulated U.S. market. Compare odds, quickly identify the best value, and even examine first-party FanDuel data all in one place. Never settle, always get the best odds. Check out the experience for free now on NumberFire or at OddsFire.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. And again, that does have odds for non-FanDuel markets, so uh, check that out for sure when you're betting in regulated markets. Ed, let's move now to covering the future. What do you got for Week 7 of the NFL? Yeah, I'm a little. I'm kind of wondering if this is the same one you might have too, just uh -oh. given our conversation earlier. Uh, I'm going to talk about Houston plus one at, at Indy. Oh, okay, um, cool. I'm not. I'm not there. We're okay. good. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, at least we'll have different games to talk about. Yes. Um, I feel like this line is an overreaction to what Indianapolis did the last time they took the football field against Kansas City. They were down three starters on the defense. Um, yet somehow managed to hold down Kansas City's offense. Uh, and I just don't think lightning strikes twice uh, for this defense. It is not a very good unit. When I look at my adjusted success rate, even with the performance against Kansas City, they're 16th in pass defense, 26th in, in run defense. And let's not forget, like they still have the same injury issues. Bleak Hooker, the safety, is out. Darius Leonard, the linebacker, and uh, Clayton Gathers, the safety, uh, are both dealing with concussions and are listed as questionable right now. So there's still potentially those injury issues on the Colts' defense. The Colts' offense is kind of what you expect without Andrew Luck. Uh, they're 27th when I look at success rate on passing, adjusted for who you played. Uh, but they are first behind a great offensive line in, in rush offense. So probably not the best way to match up with Houston. Uh, Houston has a pretty good run defense. They're 10th when I look at the adjusted success rate. I've also been looking at uh, PFF grades and a defensive tackle, uh, DJ Reader with Houston, grades out as a 90 in, in run defense. So the Colts are going to find it a lot more difficult to run the ball against Houston than they did last time out against Kansas City, who was pretty much the worst run defense in the NFL. So with all those things being said, uh, I, I think my number actually favors Houston a little bit on the road here. Uh, so I, I definitely like Houston plus one in this Interesting. game. Interesting. And as far as the Indy offense goes, I agree that they are not the best passing offense, but they 
are one of the teams. I try not to look at home road splits very much because there is so much noise. You're, you're taking yep. an already small sample and making it smaller. But the home road splits for India are drastic. And I think that they are significant because they play their home games indoors. And when they go on the road, what they've done this year is they've turned into this crazy run first offense. When they were at home and had T.Y. Hilton, they've done that for one game this year. That was in week three. They threw 66% of the time on first and second down the first half of that game. Hmm. Outside of that, they're about 53% uh, for the f- full season. So, But they do have T.Y. Hilton here. I think they're going to be more pass-heavy than they have been. So I think if I were to take a lean on this game, I might be more okay with the over on 47 because hmm. I expect them to be more pass-heavy than they've been so far this year. Uh, but I don't have any read on, on, on the line here. So you want Houston plus one, correct? Yep. Okay, so Houston plus one is for Ed. I want to go back to that game we were talking about with Gill between the Seahawks and the Ravens, and I want to sell him on me, sell me on the over because I actually like the under here. It's not like your numbers like the over too. So I will give my case, and then I want to hear yours because it's a fun game, and I do want to watch it, but I don't think it gets to 49 points because both of these teams are super run heavy. The way I want to look at this is by looking at what teams do on first and second down in the first halves of games. Uh, because that's where you know the score is not an issue. It's just what they want to do, basically. And the Seahawks rank 30th in pass rate in that situation. The Ravens are 31st. Besting only the Minnesota Vikings, so 30th and 31st between these two teams. Because of that, the Ravens are 21st in situation-neutral pace. That is according to Football Outsiders. The Seahawks are 26th, and I agree with Gil. Both these defenses are overrated, and I think that that is my biggest concern with betting the under on this game is I think both these defenses are pretty trashy, and the perception is that they're good. But... It's all about both offenses being run heavy and being relatively slow. And if this game stays close, which is not a given, I think it's going to hit the under. Uh, But the problem is, if the Seahawks get an early lead, we'll get uh, Lamar Jackson throwing a bit more. That he's been good enough, where I think that could lead to an over there. And if the Ravens get a lead, it's going to go over, because Russell Wilson (laughs) having to throw is going to lead to an over. So I think that's probably why um, smart people uh, are on the over here. I just think that this game, I expect it to stay close. And if it stays close, I think it's going to be a very slow game. So at 49, I like it. I think that Gill's probably right where you could wait on this one. Uh, I did open at 50 and a half and has come down to 49. But I believe 80% of the money is on the over, according to Odds Fire. I checked this earlier today. Uh, So you can probably wait if you want to get that, if you agree with me and think that the under is good. Uh, But I would take the under on 49 right now. So, Ed... That's where I am. Um, what pushes your numbers to prefer the over here? And how how over is it? Yeah, I mean, uh, let's see. My number is uh, 51. Okay. Uh, wait, hold on. Let me let me do it. Yeah, 51. Okay. And, I mean, with, with the way the Seattle team has evolved, it I mean, Russell Wilson has been so good, which is not unexpected because right. he's a very good quarterback. And we had a lot of questions about the defense. They added Jadavian Clowney. That's clearly a good thing, but you know, I still just yeah. don't have a ton of faith. And then when you look at the numbers for Baltimore, it's kind of the same story. Um, you know, the the offense is just way more efficient than, than the defense has been so far this season. So when you look at those efficiency things, uh, it just points to a lot of points in this game. Uh, there's obviously a lot of game situations that could 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 matter. You know, if if like right. you said, if if the Ravens get out to a big lead, you know, Russell's going to be throwing and uh, going to be running around there, inviting the sacks, and then <laughs> chucking it right into the hands of his receivers way downfield. So because that's just what he does. <laughs> um, that's well, I mean, he's he's been particularly good this yeah. year. Yeah, he's nuts. Uh, it, it, that's why I said I want to watch this game because. Course, I love yeah. watching Lamar Jackson too. It's not yep. always as pretty passing, but like he can connect deep. I mean, I mean, I feel like, I mean, I I, I feel like I owe Evan a silver apology for doubting his uh, <laughs> love of Lamar Jackson earlier this preseason because I looked at well, it, I was like, come on, man, like so, <laughs> you know, and I think, and I actually uh, know a guy that was at Ravens camp. Yeah. Who backed this up? He's like, yeah. I mean, Lamar Jackson is what he is as a passer. Like he hasn't really improved. Don't expect him to make touch passes. And then he comes out and he's throwing all these touch passes. Right. And and he's really rocking it. And and also, as as a player, like he, 
has looked more athletic than I think a lot of these athletic quarterbacks in college look in the NFL. Um, he's making plays uh, that I, I just kind of haven't seen in a long time as well. Right. So, yeah, I mean, he, he's been good. Uh, it, will he regress? Maybe. Sure. But until then, I owe Evan an apology for doubting well, him. I don't think I did publicly. There was a different part of that conversation that stuck with me. Um, Evan mentioned our bias towards lowlights, where when we see a terrible pass, we're going to overreact to that terrible pass. And it has made me hesitant to jump ship on Baker Mayfield uh, this year because we've seen a lot of terrible passes from Baker Mayfield, and that can lead to a bias against them. We've seen terrible passes from Tom Brady. And the every quarter, and I think that what I've picked up on since talking to Evan is that every quarterback makes passes that makes them look terrible. But what do they do over the larger sample? The advanced metrics say that they're good. If the advanced metrics say they're good, I'm inclined to believe they're good because every quarterback is going to look bad at one point yeah. or another. And I think that just having that voice in my mind, you know, with Evan saying that we overreact to lowlights, I think it's made me more hesitant to overreact to those things. And I think that's been very valuable for me this year. Yeah, and everyone in Ann Arbor knows about that too because there's <laughs> been a lot of lowlights with, with Shea Patterson this year. And yet somehow when I look at uh, my adjusted yards per pass attempt, you know, Michigan's 43rd, Yeah, which given how they started is is pretty good. Well, what's your thoughts on that Penn State game? We didn't talk about that one with you yesterday. Uh, yeah. It's plus nine for Michigan. What are your thoughts there? You don't yeah, have to give like a pick, uh, but... I, I don't. I, I mean, yeah. I've had a pretty strong opinion on some Michigan sides this year. Um, I think I've been on the right side of most of them. Definitely not the Wisconsin one. Um, but my number has it at eight. Uh, I, it's kind of like a no play for me. Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of different outcomes. If it, I mean, this game hasn't been close in the last three years on either side. The home team has just kind of obliterated the other team. Uh, but but good football teams on both sides. I, I just don't think that's going to happen again. I think this yeah. can be close. I mean, obviously, you have to side with Penn State to win this game. Sure. But then kind of the remarkable fact is uh, I read somewhere, if Michigan wins this, they're going to be in the driver's seat for the college football playoff, which is a true yet remarkably odd statement given how their season has gone. I didn't even think about that. Like, that thought nope. to me is... No one in Ann Arbor has, but it is a true statement. They'll be 6-1 and one with their only loss to another team that wow. is, in, is in serious contention for the playoff. And despite how they've looked in some of these games... They will be in contention. And then if they win again at Notre Dame at home the next week. Huh. I mean, they're going to be pretty, you know, and it's it's one of these things where the human polls and the numbers all have Michigan in the teens somewhere. Right. And that's exactly where they're going to be, given that, you know, they started in the top five. Disappointed. Have not have, have very have disappointed. But yet we know to make the most accurate college football predictions, you kind of have to have some balance between what we've seen and what we expected in the preseason. So, it, yeah, I mean, there's a lot riding on the game. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, only a couple turnovers, uh, you know, in the right direction for Michigan to maybe pull off the upset. The Big Ten's fun this year. I like this. Yeah. This is fun. Uh, we were talking with Ed, Edward yesterday about how, like, they could get two in the playoff. And, like, Big Ten football is yeah. gross no. a lot of times, but it can be really fun when it's good. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I think we're going to see Ohio State and Wisconsin play twice. Right, which would be really – actually be twice within like a couple of weeks, wouldn't it? I don't know when that – Oh, no, they play Wisconsin next week, I think. Is that, is that next week? I think it's next week, yeah. yeah. So that'll be fun. So if I, they split those games and somehow things break right, hmm, Oklahoma right. loses a couple games, Oregon loses a couple games. This could be fun. Clemson loses one game and people realize how terrible their schedule was. <laughs> yeah, it could be. It, it'll be interesting. I, I think we have a couple weeks until that first yeah. uh, playoff committee rankings come out. And uh, then I'll be able to run some numbers and, and, and put some probabilities behind these things, which will be which will be good. Well, now I'm excited for next week's show. So we can talk about that Ohio State versus Wisconsin game. To make sure you get that one right as it goes up, make sure you subscribe to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, I listen on Spotify, but you can listen on Apple Podcasts, uh, Stitcher, the Google Play Store, wherever you get your podcasts. You can find it. And make sure you rate and review and subscribe to the podcast as well. Ed, anything big popping for you this weekend over at the Power Rank? Yeah, I have Whale Capper on the Football Analytics Show. Uh, it's 
I, I think you guys who have listened to Whale Cop, Capper knows, like, just by the way he talks, like, this guy knows what he's, knows what he's talking about. Yeah. And when he came on my podcast, uh, we got a little bit into the technical details. Uh, not too much, but I'm, I'm very interested. Like, a lot of people who model games just try to get the average right. So we try to yeah. get a prediction for, you know, what the spread should be in Seahawks versus Ravens. But he actually looks at the variance in teams play. And we talked a lot about that uh, because that's important in, in assigning a probability that a team is going to cover. Right. Um, so just just a great conversation, um, you know, different from what we've had on this podcast because it wasn't just looking at games. And right. In fact, I didn't ask him about any game. Yeah. Uh, games did come up that he liked for this week. So obviously, if you're interested in that, go listen for that as well. Uh, but just a really fun conversation with uh, with Whale Capper. And you can get that at the Football Analytics Show wherever you get your podcasts. Well, I got to listen now so I can hear the end uh, and hear his thoughts on food and all the oh questions my God, he has at the so end. Fun. So I got to listen for that. Well, I mean, this is the sec- this is his second time yeah. on the pod. And like, I usually ask people about food the first one. Yeah. So I when I prepare for these things, I go back and I listen to what I ask them because yeah. I don't double things up. I was like, oh, I didn't ask him about food. And, you know, who knows where that's going to lead? Like some <laughs> of my guests are like, I'm, I'm not a foodie. I like to eat at home, you know, which is fine. But it was very clear as soon as I asked him that yeah. that we were both very into food and Mexican okay. food in particular. Okay. And when you just get like kind of two dogs like going at the <laughs> same T-bone steak and really excited about that, it, it was it was a lot of fun. All right. Well, I'm going to go listen to that now. Uh, so go find Ed's work over at the Power Rank. You can find uh, the podcast by, looking, by searching for the Football Analytics Show. You can find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank. I am at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We also have our DFS preview for Week 7 already up with myself and Brandon Gadula breaking down our favorite plays on the main slate. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald for running the video side of things for today as always. Always, Cal, nice to have you back. Thank you for chopping those things up for the at FanDuel Twitter account. And we'll talk to you all again next week. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Good luck with your bets, both for college football and for the NFL. And we'll talk to you again next week. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network.